president of Artahack, an EU Vertigo Starts laureate, Horizon 2020, a Fulbright World Learning Specialist in Art, New Media, and Technology, a Zero One American Arts Incubator, U.S. State Department Cultural Envoy to Kiev, Ukraine, a Fulbright Alumni Ties grantee, a Senior Research Assistant Professor at Riesebe University in Riga, Latvia, and a contributing editor to Performance Arts Journal, MIT Press. I received my PhD in digital media from the School of Creative Media at Hong Kong City University, where my brain opera, Noor, a fully immersive interactive brainwave opera premiered at Isaiah Hong Kong. Abo, my new emotionally intelligent, artificial intelligent brainwave opera, recently premiered at the Estonian Academy of Music's state-of-the-art black box theater and was part of Vertigo Starts Days in Paris, France. Maddie Barber Bockelman is a theater artist based in New York City, and she is the programs and production manager at Culture Hub, a global art and technology community founded by La Mama Experimental Theater Club and the Seoul Korea Institute of the Arts. Maddie has performed at La Mama, most recently in The Trojan Women by Elizabeth Suardos, directed by Andre Serbin, and at the Park Armory Boston Playwrights Theater, Theater for the New City, WOW Cafe, Bronx Academy of Arts and Dance, the Jean Frankel Theater, and Triskelon Arts. Her playwriting was presented by The Vortex in Austin, Texas, and Sleeping Weasel in Boston, Massachusetts. She has trained with Double Edge Theater, Labyrinth Theater, Michael Chekhov School, Strasburg Institute, and more. She was a participant of La Mama's Umbria's Symposium on Theater for Social Change and Community Engagement where she trained with the Belarus Free Theater. Maddie earned her BA in Theater and Human Rights, receiving awards for Theater and Activism and Feminist Collective at Connecticut College. Next, Christina Maurer is a cultural producer, curator and researcher with a background in cultural studies, media and art theory. Based at Ars Electronica in Linz, Austria, where we all know where that is. She develops exhibitions at the nexus of art, society, and technology, and works together with artists, universities, and scientific partners, such as the MIT Media Lab and the European Space Agency. From 2018 to 19, she served as lead producer for Compass Navigating the Future, Ars Electronica's large-scale redesign of the Ars Electronica Center. As current senior producer for European Cooperation, she develops workshops, events, lectures, and exhibitions across various European projects. Her research interests focus on the social, political, and societal implications of new technologies, the evolution of digital cultures, as well as current developments in the field of artificial intelligence, material studies, and biotechnology. Next, we have Sarah Weaver, a New York-based contemporary composer, conductor, and technologist working internationally as a specialist in network music. She has composed solo chamber and large ensemble works for groundbreaking musicians for over 20 years, integrating influences of jazz, contemporary classical, computer music, and world music. She is an innovator of telematic music live performance through the internet by musicians in different geographic locations, encompassing numerous artistic projects with collaborators and interdisciplinary projects with groups such as NASA, Kepler, K2 Mission, and the United Nations. Weaver is the director of Now Net Arts Inc., a not-for-profit organization for network arts production SyncSource LLC is the managing business for Weaver's compositional work, teaching engagements, technology applications, and recording and publishing label. She's an advisor of the International Society for Improvised Music and a member of ASCAP, College Music Society, New York Women Composers, and National Association of Composers. 
And now we have Michael de Kock, the artistic head of the well-known KVS in Brussels. And he sets its innovative artistic policy. He is also an author, director, and actor, and has published over 20 titles translated into French, English, German, Italian, Turkish, and Japanese. Michael has a degree in Romance Languages and Literature. He wrote his thesis on the theater of Natalie Sarot and graduated with great distinction. He then trained as an actor at the Conservatoire in Brussels and worked as a freelancer. From 2006 to 2016, he was the director of Ta'arsenal in Mechelen. He has directed Bash, Hedda, after Hedda Gabler, De Pulia Strata, Haven 010, Exit the King, Three Sisters, and Death of a Salesman. So thank you all for being here, and we will start with um, Maddie. Great. Um, I'm just going to start with a video. So here I go. Culture Hub is a global art and technology community that was founded in 2009 by La Mama Experimental Theater Club in New York City and the Seoul Institute of the Arts in Korea. Our goal is really to bring people together to fuel artist mobility and to deepen our human connection that exists across the globe. Our team in New York City had been working exceedingly hard preparing ReFest, our annual festival that brings artists, activists, and technologists together. So when news started to develop about the coronavirus, we were able to make a shift to transform ReFest to be online only by uh, live streaming the entire festival for the three days. Uh, I think that we're realizing more and more how globally connected we are. I felt that it was a really exciting decision because at a moment when the world was shutting down and fear was growing, we were offering a creative experience for people to engage with. It showed us that there really is a potential of sharing artwork and sharing important conversations with an audience online. It just so happens that we, as Culture Hub, have been developing a tool for remote collaboration over the past five years called Live Lab. It was built with the intention of facilitating performances and educational experiences um, and cultural exchange. Using Live Lab, we produce Downtown Variety and are still producing Downtown Variety, which has allowed us to meet countless artists that we wouldn't have worked with otherwise because they are distributed across the country and across the globe. It was a really exciting process to be a part of because we really felt like we were seeing an emerging aesthetic um, on Downtown Variety in our other collaborations and programming. People were really pushing each other to to make something new together, even though we were all distributed. I keep considering us to be in a collective hackathon where all of a sudden we all have to think about how we connect with each other. We feel isolated and we feel like we're all alone. That's why Grace and I are speaking through this microphone to reach you wherever you sit and decide your home. To realize we're all connected and you're definitely not alone. We have started to develop this emerging community of folks who are using Live Lab um, in their own performances, in musical collaborations, in dance collaborations, in their teaching, in all these different ways that we couldn't have envisioned. I'm back. I think Live Lab is just is now a tool that we're using um, for artistic creation, for reasons of social activism, and to really be of service to our artistic community. And it said, we are one. Thanks, Culture Hub. Hey, thank you, Jim Finley. Live Lab became essential to our producing practice that emerged in the pandemic. It really is making our original question of how can we use the internet to be of service to our artistic community that is a global community. It's embodying that every day. 
we are just so deeply grateful for the artists who have thrown down and really pushed the envelope to show us new new ways forward new futures and there's so much more to, more be, to discovered be discovered in this, in this space, space. Great. So that's the story. I won't say too much else, but as you might have heard before and seen in the video, I'm Maddie Barbara Bockelman. I work with Culture Hub in New York City. Um, we are still producing Downtown Variety, which is going to launch um, as a, the season launches with La Mama on September 18th, which is one week from today at 8 p.m. And we've got a bunch of really interesting artists who are going to be working with us, including Annie B. Parsons, Belarus Free Theater, DJ Spooky, um, Rafia Santana, Noom Collective, and Tereke Ortiz with Cameron Neal and Shyak Misha Chowdhury. Um, so lots of exciting artists are coming to work with us um, in just one week. And uh, yes, Live Lab is that tool that we were that that we had shared about a a, a media router, a browser-based media router for collaborative performance. Um, and if you want to learn more about that right now, uh, you can go to culturehub.org/livelab, um, and we have online tutorials, manuals, and upcoming meetups and um, trainings that can get you more in the know of what's going on. That's good for me right now. I'd love to hear from everyone else. Uh, up next is Christina. Thank you very much, Ellen. And uh, thanks, first of all, to uh, the GRID, the Exposure team, for having us all today for this discussion. Um, I'm a senior producer working at Ars Electronica. Um, Ars Electronica is a platform uh, for arts, uh, technology and society. We were founded in 1979 uh, in Linz in Austria um, to kind of pave the way for a new uh, avant-garde that was growing during that time of artists, scientists and researchers who started experimenting with digital media um, and across also a lot of disciplines, um, a lot of transdisciplinary work that started happening in that time. And for many years, it was a kind of meeting hub each year for uh, for a very niche audience. Um, but over the past years, maybe 10, 15 years, the festival has evolved into uh, something much bigger, a public forum. Um, we uh, now have, since the mid-90s, the Ars Electronica Center, which is our permanent home base uh, each year, which is focused on um, didactic approaches, education, uh, but also artistic projects, showing exhibitions um, and developing a rich uh, portfolio and framework for workshops. We have the pre Arza Electronica, which is our yearly competition for media arts. Um, we have, of course, still the Arza Electronica Festival that is a platform each year for our international community. The Arza Electronica Future Lab is our R&D hub. Um, we do a lot of international exhibitions uh, across the globe with Ars Electronica Export. And we also have our very own festival for uh, the young generation from zero to 19 called uh, U19 Create Your World. Um, so that's just a brief run through about the pillars of Ars Electronica and um, in the kind of areas in which we operate. So just a few words about my background. Um, I'm a curator, exhibition developer, uh, and I would also call myself a storyteller. So the past few years, I have been working at the Ars Electronica Center, uh, developing exhibitions, and um, recently moved into the field of EU project development and production. Um, so just to give you an idea of what I've been working on for the past few years, um, I've been developing exhibitions on artificial intelligence, such as uh, the one uh, which we opened last year in the Ars Electronica Center. Um, I've been developing a new set of, of laboratories at the center um, or working as Ellen already introduced with collaborators such as the MIT Media Lab and the Tangible Media Group. 
Um, so I want to focus today uh, in this very short introduction a little bit on two different aspects uh, of how Ars Electronica has had to deal with uh, the pandemic or how it has affected us. And the one is basically from the perspective of the Ars Electronica Center. Um, the center is basically our year-round hub, um, very focused on regional uh, audiences, um, but also very focused on a large network of teachers and schools, uh, educators, and uh, basically the young generation coming to the center and getting their, um, let's say, hands uh, into all kinds of digital technologies and uh, getting a first understanding of, of digital technologies. So the whole Ars Electronica Center is very much based on um, hands-on experiences, on interacting with each other, um, on uh, touching interfaces, on, on getting a first idea of, of what a lab can be, what a bio lab can look like. Um, so the whole uh, experience relies completely on connection, on human connection, uh, on human communication. So even though the topic is, of course, uh, kind of the, the communication between physical and digital realms, um, the conduit for it is always the discussion and the communication with the humans at the Ars Electronica Center, with the visitors, but as well as our staff who is there. Um, so, of course, when we were faced uh, with uh, the lockdown in March, we completely had to rethink our educational framework, our mediation concept, as we had to close the Ars Electronica Center down. And um, we basically set up a streaming service called Home Delivery that allowed our audience to still get an insight into what's going on in the Ars Electronica Center every day um, through stream programs that were run um, completely with the team in-house at the Ars Electronica Center. Um, and that allowed also the, the staff to kind of show their um, specific fields of expertise. Um, and basically it turned all of all of the the museum community working there into um, creators of of videos of digital content so the experience of being in the center of working there but also of experience experiencing what's going on there just turned around uh, 100 percent um so from basically an experience where you really have to to touch the interfaces to under, understand them to get into them uh you now could only watch what was going on through your screen um so we were just faced with developing a completely new way of interacting with our audience and um, this of course looks very different to the usual scenes you might see at the Ars Electronic uh, Festival um, and the center if you come visit us during September in Linz. Um, this is also related of course to kind of uh, spaces, hybrid spatial experiences that you can have uh, with us. So the Ars Electronic Deep Space is usually something where you can experience artworks, um, creative pieces by artists, but by young researchers, by the artistic community also from Linz who use this space very often uh, for experimentation, for developing work. So this whole space is kind of based on bringing people together, interacting with each other. Um, and also these kinds of spaces are of course very much affected um, by our current situation. So we also have to uh, kind of find ways for people to still experience what's going on there um, while being aware that in the end um, we cannot replace the feeling of being in the space uh, if you are in the Ars Electronica Center. Um, and it's a very similar kind of situation also for the Ars Electronica Festival, of course, where we welcome each year around 100,000 uh, visitors um, regional audiences, but of course also our very large international community who come to Linz each year. And um, again, the artistic practice, um, the media arts community, the hybrid arts community, transdisciplinary arts community is of course uh, very much focused on developing art pieces um, that you can get close to, that you can touch, that you can interact with. So it's a lot about making uh, the kind of hidden digital layer that we all deal with each day tangible and, and 
to find ways to to for people to experience these layers through interfaces through art pieces um, and basically if you're at the Ars Electronica festival you will always be asked to have a, a, an experience with tangible interfaces that that want to be touched that want to be interacted with uh, that might even need a second person to work um, so i would say that uh, the essence of the festival as the essence of the Ars Electronica center um, is really human connection so uh, the community, our community, um, I would say, which is a very hybrid community, as you all know, visits the festival to connect, to communicate, to get inspired, to open up new fields of collaboration. Um, and from my personal experience and view, the community is one that is always looking to grow and to gain knowledge through connecting with others, with artists, scientists, engineers. Um, so for us, of course, we were faced with the set situation that um, we had to find ways also in the Ars Electronica Festival to connect um, digitally with our audiences. Uh, so going from this year's Ars Electronica topic, Kepler's Gardens, uh, or in Kepler's Gardens, which is a reference to our new festival location, um, we invited a community of 120 partners to also become um, gardens themselves and to uh, create their own programming. While uh, here in Linz, we would share everything with our audience who is not able to visit us this year through an online um, streaming platform. So. Similarly to the Ars Electronica Center, uh, the festival experience this one uh, this year is just a completely different one than past years. Um, so you will always have the kind of a screen between yourself and your collaboration partners, uh, your friends who come visit Linz each year. Um, and that's not to say that the programs that are being developed by uh, the Ars Electronica Gardens this year aren't amazing. So there are some fantastic contents that you can experience during uh, the online part of the festival. Um, but still, I think it's uh, it really shows what our community, what the media arts community um, kind of has had to deal with this year in a way. Um, and so the festival this year looks very much uh, like this, like uh, a a production office bringing together partners on different screens um, and it also looks very much like this connecting with all of our international partners in in a variety of shared sessions um, and something i really noticed in this in talking with uh, all our collaborators over the past few you few days in many many online sessions is that the whole community is is really really missing this connection that we we usually have um and uh i think for me what it what it showed is that um we have to find so it's very difficult for us to only be connected through screens because the media arts community and this kind of hybrid community that we work in um, is is so used to connecting and to setting up networks um, physical connections uh, that we will have uh, to put some serious thought into how we can develop platforms um, that still make for uh, an inspiring kind of exchange between everybody who's working in this field. So thank you very much for, for your attention and I'm basically handing over to the next contributor and Ellen. Okay, so thank you, Christina. And that's actually some of the things we're gonna be discussing. So thank you for that. And next we have Sarah Weaver. Uh, thank you very much, I'm Ellen, and I'm very happy to be here with all the panelists. Um, I'm going to go ahead and give a verbal presentation and invite you to look at our website, nownetarts.org, uh, for information on our organization and uh, media. So um, my name is Sarah Weaver. I'm the director of Nownet Arts, also a composer, technologist, and researcher. Uh, now Net Arts is a not-for-profit organization we were founded in 2017 to produce and present contemporary network arts works, technologies, educational programs, and publications. 
Uh, Network Arts utilizes the internet and related technologies as an artistic medium for works created for this platform. Uh, we're based in New York City and also working internationally. And drawing upon work from the past 15 years and beyond, uh, this field of network arts has accelerated with the ability to produce concert quality, multi-channel audio and video with low latency for live collaboration via the internet, together with renowned contemporary artists pioneering work for this medium. Uh, within our programs, we have social purposes in peace building, bridging the digital divide, and diversity in contemporary arts. Uh, due to the pandemic, all of our programs have moved entirely online. And uh, one of our efforts in this area is the Nounet Arts Lab Ensemble. So this group is open to contemporary acoustic and electronic instruments, vocalists, actors, dancers, and visual or video artists. Uh, we ran March to June 2020 daily labs and weekly demo performances. This fall, from September to December 2020, on the first week of each month, we're running the Lab Ensemble. We've had participants from 16 countries and doing large ensemble works uh, by the director and also chamber works by the lab participants. You can contact Nounet Arts for more information. Uh, the technology we've been utilizing is a transition from high bandwidth, high quality of service institutional internet to inclusion of public internet and home internet. Also, the transition again to fully online programs and within that connecting many individuals instead of site to site. Uh, so for audio, uh, we're using platforms such as JackTrip, Zoom Audio, and Jamulus. In video, uh, platforms include UltraGrid, Zoom, Jitsi, and open broadcasting software, uh, otherwise known as OBS. Our audiences can attend in Zoom, Vimeo, YouTube, and uh, we're developing independent virtual halls. In our annual Nounet Arts Festival, uh, we present network arts works, interdisciplinary arts, chamber works, and large ensemble works. In 2018, uh, we had artists in Portugal, New York, San Diego, and Seoul, all performing together live online. And we also had an online stream and audiences in each location. Also in 2019, uh, those locations were Chicago, London, New York, Toronto, and Zurich. Uh, again, performing together online and also an online uh, stream to audience. In 2020, uh, all of our locations will be online and each individual uh, will be at their own location. And that program will be on December 20th, 2020. And technologies we're uh, working on using are again, Jack Trip, UltraGrid, Zoom, OBS, and Independent Virtual Hall. We have an annual Nounet Arts Conference. And uh, to give you an idea of the evolution of our themes here, uh, in 2018, we had uh, network music, artistic and technological strategies for public and private networks. In 2019, with social purpose and contemporary network arts. And coming up in 2020, uh, we have network arts and social distance, capacities and innovations. That program is November 5th through 8th, 2020. So our structure, uh, we have our headquarters as the at the Institute for Advanced Computational Science at Stony Brook University in New York. In 2018, we added uh, 30 international remote sites. And in 2019, in addition to those remote sites, we had a satellite sites. And in 2020, it will be mostly remote sites this year. Our technology for the conference, uh, JackTrip, UltraGrid, Lola, Zoom, and also wireless developers. In the areas of research, I'm, I'm the editor of the Journal of Network Music and Arts, JANMA. Uh, this journal was founded in 2019. This is a peer-reviewed, open-access digital research journal published by Stony Brook University. Uh, we've published two issues so far, uh, Volume 1, which was last year in 2019, and a recent publication, Volume 2, Issue 1, for 2020, and we'll have another issue at the end of the year. And you can find this journal online. Again, just look for Journal of Network Music and Arts. Uh, thank you very much, and looking forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you, Sarah. And, um, you know, we should all visit your site because... Sarah has been a leader in the field of um, high-speed online collaborations for decades. Um, so I just want to emphasize that. And next we have Michael, and um, we're really looking forward to your presentation, Michael. So please take it away. 
Hello, good evening, everybody. Very happy to be with you um, on this panel uh, from Brussels, uh, Belgium. Um, evening here for you, it's uh, still noon. Uh, I Just like Sarah, I won't show you any videos or I won't share my screen, but I just want to tell you something more about um, togetherness, space and time. So um, the COVID-19 uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has now um, started like six months ago. It was on the news uh, a, few, a few hours ago, six re just six months ago it started. It was called a pandemic. First of all, I want to point out that really uh, many, many artists also in Europe and in Belgium and in Brussels are um, hit by this pandemic. They lost their jobs. Um, so I, I think I really think that the biggest tragedy is with the artists. Um, I want to stress that out before saying which solutions we try to find. Uh, I want to I want to explain uh, or talk to you about four uh, things we did to give an answer uh, to this uh, pandemic and to find new ways of connecting and to find new ways of togetherness. First of all, uh, a very simple thing, like many others did in the beginning, already in April, we started streaming old shows. Um, or shows who have been made just a few months earlier. Not that much because I think um, streaming and all the technological solutions are not really, really the, the same as being together um, or to share time and space. So, um, but the, the shows who fit it, we, we stream them. So for example, we did uh, a few years ago, I did the whole Odyssey of Homeros, so the whole Ulysses, and we stream them like 24 hours every day, an episode like a soap an actor playing um, every day one chapter and well it worked quite well some shows don't work that that well for me because you know um, because they just don't fit to to see on a, on a small screen but that's what we did in the beginning and very soon already we were we started thinking how we could um, give answers to the pandemic and the first thing we did was reschedule the next season so already in april may we started rescheduling and pushing back the big shows or postponing them to a later uh, period because there are two several uh, problems there's dealing with the audience how they can be together in safe conditions and there's dealing with the artists how they can work how you can produce them in a very um, safe way concerning the audience because i'm also part in belgium of this crisis cell in which we try to to guide the the theater field through this crisis um, now we can fill the venues up to 60 percent again so we hope to fill them again up to let's say 80 or 90 of, in a few months but so now we're, the venues are half full as we speak now the show dear winnie is shown uh, in in the venue of uh, kvs because it's a theater festival and the show was selected so the first thing we did was postponing the big shows because there's a course there there was because they're economically it's difficult to play big shows because you have less um, people watching the show and because if you have big ensembles it's dangerous because if one person is infected the, uh, the testing and the tracing is the thing we're dealing with now uh, how you can keep the teams uh, safe and how you can make them work that's what that's the next challenge so that's what we did first second of all we made the decision to produce more than ever because i said in the beginning the the, the people who suffer the most from all this crisis are not the institutions but it's it's the people behind it's the people making the art so we started to produce more than ever but in a covid proof way so we started to produce small shows we have the big opportunity or the big um, advantage if you open the back doors of the theater you come on this marvelous square um, we have this Indian summer normally in, in Europe uh, or in Brussels, uh, September and October. So we decided to produce two or three shows, really small shows, one actor, two actors uh, who play uh, outside. Um, those shows are being shown right now and, and um, well, they're a big success. It works very well. It's a location theater. That's one thing. We did an open call for choreographers to dance, to make a solo performance of half an hour outside, also on the square, because we thought we gave them like a month's salary. Um, even we decided that in April when everything was shut down, because we thought if we give them that, we make them work. And even if we are code red and we cannot show anything, they can they can go on a square anywhere in the city, perform or film it, or we can find solutions to, to make that accessible to the audience. And the third show we programmed, and that's what I was talking about when I was mentioning space and time, is the light that never goes out. We will be playing that next weekend. And the light that never goes out is actually a light, I don't know if you're aware of that, but who's always burning in the theater, even at night when the venue is closed and there's nobody. So there's always one light, they call it in French, la servante, the servante, the light that, you know, that, that um, is there to, to keep the theater safe and when somebody has to rush in, 
that you can see something. So what we did was normally a full venue in, in, in our theater is like 500 people. So what we did was we, we, we want to have those 500 people in a marathon of 24 hours. It means we have like one uh, light burning on stage, the light that never goes out. We have like four or five uh, spectators on the, on the stage. They go into an empty theater, they go sit on the stage and one actor, performer, dancer comes and does a performance of 10 or 12 minutes. And that we will do for like 24 hours. And at the end of the 24 hours, we will have like a full venue. That's another thing we organized. Uh, fourth thing we is because we have regular theater and we're the, the being together and the being together with, with the audience is very important. The fourth thing is that we developed, developed a platform uh, which is called KVS 24-7, which means, and it's also very important for our international work, which means it's a streaming site. I mean, it's a site, it's not only a site, but it's, it's like a lounge in which uh, the spectator can go where he can see some some rehearsal stuff where he can there's a chat room so where we try to find out a new way of watching theater because we all know when you watch streamings you're distracted but but we try to find a way in which we don't care about that or we accept the fact that there's a new way way of telling stories and, and getting to the audience uh, we just developed that like the whole summer uh, we had young programmers working on it that you can visit the platform it's now online um, so we're really developing it we made a map of the city so when you go into the to the platform you're like visiting a little bit brussels you pick out your room you go to one some artists want want shows to be streamed other want to keep them on it for a longer time but it's not not every artist really wants that so it's like really a dialogue with the artist to see how we can disclose their work and how we even can show uh, our work at the other side of the world for example we have now in the theater manuela infante who comes from santiago chile um, it's a co-production with Santiago Amil in, in Santiago. No, so she's making the show in Brussels. Normally you have to go over to Chile, Santiago in, in, in January. Maybe we will, but maybe we won't. So because of this platform now we can share the premiere like we're talking with you now. Uh, we can do that um, on a global scale and, and, and honor co-productions um, um, through that platform uh, and honor our, 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 um, our co-producers. Uh, because I think, and that's my, my, uh, the last thing I want to, I want to tell about that people are telling, finding solutions or medicines to, to save us from, from coronavirus. I think we should find a way to deal with it, uh, and to coexist with it for the moment. So, because, uh, the theater is not, we have to make it as safe as possible, but we cannot exclude any risk. So we have to coexist with it, to wear masks, to have the gels around, but to coexist with the virus. Um, there are not many good sides at, the, at, at what's happening. One good, one maybe one good aspect is that we find new ways that, 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 and that we discover once again how fragile we humans are, how fragile humanity is, and how important, because that's, I think, so, so important, how uh, how important culture is to us all and how important storytelling is to us all. Because if there's one thing we discovered through all this crisis, and it's also the reason why we are together here tonight or at noon, um, that is that it's that we have to find new ways of, of being together with our audiences and to support our artists because they make us human. Thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. And these are some questions that we will certainly talk about. Next, I'm going to just show a very short uh, uh, six minute clip, which has me talking of what we just finished two weeks ago um, in New York. And uh, uh, I'll explain this later, but I'll just let you guys see it. Hear what it. you are about to experience are two breakthrough dance performances, which show new possibilities of live performance within the constraints of strict lockdown due to COVID-19. These performances were incubated over six weeks by Artahack and ThoughtWorks Arts and broadcast as part of the 39th Battery Dance Festival, which this year is fully virtual. In these dance gemic performances, dancers wear emoti-bit sensor devices on their bodies, live broadcasting their heart rate, blood oxygen, muscle contractions, humidity, and other biometrics. To create these works, a global open call went out from Artahack for creative technologists, artists, musicians, dramaturgists, costume designers, 
theatrical producers, engineers, and others to work with two dancers from the Battery Dance Company who would be wearing the emoji bits on their bodies. Team members applied from all across the continental US, Brazil, London, Ukraine, Estonia, and India. We partnered with Electron based in Tallinn, Estonia to use their unique performative streaming platform in existence only since April of this year. All of the collaborators participated remotely. None of the collaborators had ever met before. No one but the dancers were physically present in the studio. The first performance by Razvan Stoya draws on language to describe the perceptual experience of otherness. Shifting between Razvan's native Romanian and adopted English, the work uses both visuals and audio to evoke the tension of moving through an unfamiliar landscape, both literal and perceptual. The choreography is a study in contrast, turbulence and calm, dark and light, the inner and outer world. Data collected from his blood oxygen and muscle tension changes the color, size, speed, and sound of the words on the screen. The next presentation, performed by Hussein Simko, examines an individual's journey of finding mental strength and resilience in the face of adversity and chaos. Hussein's memories of growing up in wartime Iraq, Kurdistan, forms the backbone of the piece. He was also inspired by the practice of a ronin, a masterless samurai, where in any situation, one must find calmness from within to stay grounded. The biometrics being read by a Modi bit worn on Hussein's forehead are represented visually in the form of colored strokes surrounding the dancer. Thank <laughs> you. 
Thank you so much for watching these performative experimental experiences. We have been working through isolation and lockdown to show how the power of art and technology can be effective in breaking down barriers between people, whether it is about immigration, migration and otherness, or our own feelings of confinement. Okay, so we have quite an amazing group of people here. And um, I want to just highlight one or two points before the panel comes back in to discuss things. One is that the experience of lockdown uh, in New York has been slightly different than the experience of lockdown in Europe in that we've had uh, tremendous social unrest. Uh, we've had um, a spike in crime. Um, we've had a lot of uh, very direct changes happen very quickly. The subway has shut down for the first time ever. Um, and so the isolation and lockdown is very, a very real thing. We're not, uh, we're just beginning to slowly emerge from it. So in that context, uh, I wanted to talk uh, both as New York and Europe because our government support and structures are very different than what you have in Europe. So I wanted to contextualize that. So I, I do have some questions um, unless anyone has something pressing they'd like to say first. Okay. Well, I've really been thinking through this whole isolation and lockdown thing. And so the postmodern condition emerged alongside an increasing concentration of power in the hands of those who control information the economic system and knowledge production itself. And some of what we've shown has been our creative response to this, especially in New York, we, um, uh, we have created our own platforms that circumvent this entire structure. During the pandemic, larger organizations and institutions shut down and they laid off almost all of their staff. So we did not have cultural support in large institutions. Europe and the US have a different structure in place um, and in terms of both support and knowledge production. So how has this difference affected you? And please feel free to jump in. I'll, I'll let the lady, one of the ladies start. Or should I start as a, as a minority, as a man here in the panel? I, I, well, I don't think, my, uh, Michael, I don't think it's that. I think it's a matter of, you know, you have a, and you both at ours and in um, Belgium, you know, you have a, a support system and we don't. Absolutely. And, Absolutely. Yeah, that's a very big difference. I even wanted to talk about it in my uh, little speech, but that's a very big difference, which, which is really relevant to point out. We have a we have a subventional system, although there have been some several budget cuts in, in the beginning of March. We have a uh, we, we have a theater and a whole uh, field where theaters have subventions. And what happened when we all went to the lockdown is that the most a lot because there's been like this big crisis with a lot of independent artists and lots of people lost their jobs and a lot of money. But on the other hand, the institutions were safe and a lot of lot of people working in the institutions could go uh, to unemployment and uh, got paid by the government. So there's been there's been some funding to to make the um, to make to to fill the gap or to to make um, people um, survive. Although it, it, it won't last forever, although it's difficult to get to this funding because you have to fill in papers and lots of stuff, and although it won't last forever, of course, it's a very, very, very big difference. We also can, can, can compare with England where you see that they have like 80% they have to get from, from tickets. We have to get like 30 and a little bit more percent, which means that we are, we, the, the, the subventional part of the culture was more safe and could um, survive this very difficult period. That's a fact. Okay, well, I, I, I'd just like to say something. Uh, I, Maddie, can you talk about Live Lab and how that was built from the ground up? Sure. Um, yeah, Live Lab is an open source uh, browser-based media router for collaborative performance that Culture Hub 
has been developing since 2015. So basically the story is that um, Culture Hub was founded in 2009 to ex explore um, a deep, deep relationship that La Mama and the Seoul Institute of the Arts, um, New York and Korea had and, and asked the question, how can we use the internet and emerging technologies to deepen um, this relationship? And we were experimenting in the earlier days with um, hardware systems, very expensive hardware systems that worked really well, but then, you know, you could only call one person up. And so it was very limited. Um, and then we were working with, um, you know, things like uh, Zoom or Skype then, but, um, and, and we were frustrated with the limitations of how it flattened all the media to one plane, um, how you couldn't customize it based on two different locations. And, and the goal really was to um, have people in two separate physical locations in theaters um, and say, I want Sarah's video feed to go to the TV in New York. And in uh, Brazil, I want my video feed to be projected on the ceiling. So having very distinct needs and wanting different audio routing so that it's it's not all coming as, as one package. Um, and so we started experimenting with um, Olivia Jack, who's a creative coder. She started working with us to develop um, a prototype and then um, and then a beta version of Live Lab, which um, we've yeah we've been developing at a much more rapid. Uh, you know, we got a kick in the butt and during the pandemic because all of a sudden everybody is a is a remote collaborator, and we all need to you know, traverse this border of the home in order to work together. Um, so it was a tool that was originally developed for uh, to be integrated into a physical space um, to open up a window to another another world in in the art piece, because that's that's present with for, for us on cell phones and on our computers. It should be present for us in in our artworks as well. Um, and then, yeah, here we are, and we're we're working on it as a as a remote, as a remote multi location um, system. So I just want to add to that that um, Culture Hub is giving free classes in this technology, so anyone around the world can learn it. And yeah. Sarah, you've been working with Jack, Jack Trip and IPv6, which is you know high speed research fiber optic networks for decades. And that completely circumvents any power structure at all, except the research network backbone. So can you talk about that a little bit? Okay. Okay. okay no, okay. <laughs> all right. I, I also wanted to say I, I do agree with you. Um, you were mentioning earlier about the, the dramatic shift in New York City. And there's, I hesitated to answer because there's really a lot of unknowns going on right now. Um, the institutions are closed and... Uh, it remains to be seen which ones will open again and will they be the large institutions or the smaller venues and which artists are going to be left here uh, when things open back up. So uh, I think there's, there's just a lot of unknowns and we have to keep innovating as we go here. Uh, so as Ellen was mentioning, uh, I have been working for decades in this field and but primarily using uh, high bandwidth uh, high quality of service institutional level internet, which is what we needed to run the technology in order to perform together live in different locations. So one of the dramatic shifts that uh, we have gone through, which is also one of the reasons I founded Down at Arts a couple of years ago, was to try to bring this work more into arts venues and uh, into the home. So this summer, uh, there's been a technology, uh, I would call a revolution <laughs> in, in, our, in our field to uh, have this uh, working at home, and there's a lot, been a lot of uh, adaptions of right, the technology uh, that is still underway. So um, being able to perform uh, with uh, people in their own individual locations uh, is a much different structure. But in figuring that out, uh, again, as you talk about circumventing um, these uh, other structures, uh, absolutely, you know, this is uh, happening right now in this work. Thank you. Um, I, I want to bring in Christina for a minute, but I want to just say one thing. Uh, when we did uh, our dance demic art hack, um, we worked with Electron in Estonia, and the Estonian government had funded that platform. 
And that was because the people in Estonia found that Facebook and YouTube were cutting off their content at, for copyright violations, even if it was the performer's own piece. And they said, let's make our own platform from the ground up. And so now this platform exists and nobody can get their hands on it except Electron letting people get their hands on it. So they've jumped over Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, everybody, as has Culture Hub and has what Sarah has done. So, um, Christina, you know, ours uh, straddles a very interesting road here because it's both institutional but supporting independent artists. So uh, could you address this, please? Um, sure. So as you said, um, we are at a kind of delicate border where, of course, as an institution, we are um, supported in a way by uh, our by the our carriers. So ours is an institution of the city of Linz. So we do get support from the city. Um, we also have a lot of European projects running, um, which is also something that uh, is often accessible to institutions, of course. Um, but I think where we can now kind of uh, use these structures also is by applying um, funding in European projects to now supporting the artists. Um, so. For example, redirecting funding that we had been planning to use for events uh, to support them to create new art pieces, which is something that we have done for this Ars Electronica Festival, for example. So I think um, there are possibilities to find ways uh, to use this institutional funding to now support the artists, which really do uh, need the support the most at the moment. And I would say, I would echo what Michael has said. Uh, we do have a, a support net from the government here in Austria, but the support net, of course, is here for the institutions in a way um, who have access to it. So uh, I think the important thing now is to really think about how can we uh, really use the funds that are available to us, even though as institutions we also are dealing with um, uh, stress on our budgets because of the situation, because of um, like entrance fees that we cannot uh, generate because the museum is closed, um, festival tickets that we cannot uh, that cannot be generated this year. Um, but still, I think the, the most important thing is to think about how we can uh, use the funding available to support the artists. Um, to enable them to produce work now um, during this difficult time. Okay, so I, I just want to say that another difference is we have a very um, gritty, very long-standing underground and DIY or do-it-yourself culture here. I mean, we have risen up from the ashes before in the 1970s and 80s you know, with 9-11, which actually today is 9-11. So that's really ironic. Um, and so, you know, there's this um, uh, ethos here of, well, if no one will help us, we'll help ourselves, okay? But given that context, I just want to pose a new question, which is Lucy Lepard and John Chandler wrote in 1967 that technology offered a curious kind of utopianism whose tabla rasa would provide a think through of ideas determined by the artwork as a catalyst or device welded by those experiencing it. During that time, new technologies were thought of as transformational media when put into the hands of people who broadcast messages of harmony and love. This was in 1967. So a lot has changed since that time, but the idea of technology being able to be the savior uh, as it's being um, sort of put on the spotlight now um, is a little bit of a hype. And so how would you respond to that? Which would be a more critical view to the hype of technology. I, I personally, if I may, I, I don't think technology is a savior um, of the arts. I think at the best, it's a very postmodern idea. You know, um, 
theater performance is a very hybrid art. It's very, uh, you know, we have languages and semiotics coming from all over. Um, for me, like I, like I mentioned in, in my uh, little speech or in my short introduction, I think that the, the humanity and the togetherness, even more when we're, when we're living is in, I think theater, what's happening on TikTok, what's happening on Twitter, what's happening on Facebook, I think the answer to that is not the imitation of it. So I, I really, if DIY takes us elsewhere, and I agree with you that in, in times of big crisis, lots of inspiration and other solutions pop up. But I think the, um, it's, it's, it's in, in a way of, of, um, of a, a new way of being global. I think we should not lose the, the, the global aspect, but also focus again on the very local aspect of the being together. And I think that's what we've been doing here like the last weeks. We really have to struggle to reopen the theaters. I don't know what's happening now in the States, but in Europe, that's a struggle going on now, how much the social distancing should be. Um, in France, there, every country is different, but in France, they're going to lift the social distancing very soon, I hope also here, because we have to fight for it, because that was a main issue in Europe, although there are subventions. Um, the planes were open, bars were open, restaurants were opening, but the cultural places were closed. So I think we have to fight for that, um, that, that being together and that sharing stories. So... I think technology can be a big help for theater. You showed it in the videos, Ellen, just before. I think they are not the only answer. And I think we, in these times, more than ever, we need, again, uh, big and big stories um, to share with people. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, Maddie, please, because you you deal both in tech and in real theater. Yeah. Um, yeah. And maybe perhaps art is the savior of technology, not not the other way around, but um, I think at Culture Hub, we have a really strong belief. Um, I think part of it comes from, okay, so the fact that so much of the technology that we're using is generated from a corporate structure. So it's treating the people who are using it as users and as consumers. And there are previously mapped out ways that we're supposed to engage with it. We think it's some artists, not all artists, but some artists' responsibility to engage with that technology and perhaps even imagine new technologies that um, do things that, that the people with the most power um, wouldn't have expected. And that can be a, both a symbiotic relationship, it can, it can create new possibilities for technology, imagine new technologies, and it can, and what we hold is that it's it's also a highly critical relationship. So artists are there to be critical of all aspects of society and technology is included. Technology shouldn't be considered the final plug-in, which theater, you know, I come from a theater background and and we do rehearsal, we do writing, we do everything for, for I mean, sometimes three weeks, but then you tack tech on right at the end. And um, we try to think of technology more as a collaborator because it is so much a collaborator in our daily lives as human beings. And it is how we connect with so many people and, and so many stories that are real life stories and media. Um, and, and I also think that right now um, technology is, uh, the way that we're using it is crisis management. It's not sustained, um, it's not sustainable yet and we need to fight to not only bring the um bring theater back and and bring live arts experiences and interactions back but we need to figure out how technology is going to sustain us as a local um, ecosystem and a global one because there are going to be more crises there's going to be more reasons that the borders can get shut down um now that 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 the powers that be have flexed those muscles, maybe it's going to happen more often. Or, um, you know, climate change, it's its real. We can't fly every every other month. You know, I don't want to sound um, so de depressing, but um, technology is, is going to need to be a part of the solution here. Yeah, and, and I just want to say, you know, uh, Sarah, you've done... Um, concerts with the United Nations for peace. I know you've really done a lot of work around peace and technology for a very long time. So how would you talk about that? Yes, well, that is one of the uh, positive capacities of, of technology. Uh, for example, when we were uh, doing those concerts um, at the United Nations headquarters and connecting with uh, musicians in other uh, countries, 
uh, it was also for diplomacy and that the arts um, have uh, their own inherent diplomacy, right? In addition to uh, politics and other, other means. And I think that's uh, one example of maybe a way you can uh, think about this time is that we could realize even more fully what the uh, positive aspects of technology are and then reintegrate that when we have, when we're back also in person. Okay. Thank you. And, and Christina, what, what would you say about that uh, in terms of, you know, cause you, ours has a very long, long history and, and probably started around the time of techno utopianism. Um, yes, uh, definitely. I think that uh, especially in the community of artists we work with, uh, there are a lot of critical perspectives uh, of the underly underlying power structures behind the technologies we use. Um, so it's a topic that we address um, in the festival as well as in the Ars Electronica Center through working with artists that have a um, very critical position on these topics and I think especially now it's we are at a moment in time where we really have to question how we apply technologies, how we develop them, who develops them, who programs them, who has the kind of power behind what we are using every day um, and I think especially during this crisis, we are also kind of seeing really what the limitations um, are of the technologies. And I feel like there was maybe a sense of, of complacency that technologies are saving us currently in a way. Um, but I think now we are seeing even more that it's not the case. It's uh, urgent to be critical, to question them, to question who's setting up the structures, who's building the frameworks. Um, and for me, the artistic practice that I think we are all working with, the artists that we are working with, uh, are really critical in highlighting those topics and, and challenges. Uh, okay, uh, so I, I'm going to just jump in because we had a question, I'm gonna read it and I'll address it first. And then if anyone has something to say, uh so is there a way to create a platform that allows people to feel they're in the same room as split squares well you know um i i'm i'm going to take that on and i'm not going to talk about virtual reality because that's a way to talk about it but what i'm going to say is that the electron platform that we used what we didn't show you because we edited it was there was lifetime audience interaction of both chat visuals and there was a feature that we wanted to implement that at the last moment technically we couldn't which would be a emotional recognition feature because the team was working on it of the audience's reaction so lifetime the the feed would also show the audience is happy the audience is interested the audience is bored you know with anonymized data collection um that feature just wasn't ready by the time we launched so that's one thing um the other thing is you know there's plenty of work done in virtual reality that answers that question and we're not talking about virtual reality here at this moment because of the uh, the back end technologies that make it extremely difficult, if not impossible, on the network to compress visual information. And I'll say, Sarah, you know that very, very well because um, audio compresses very well, and video on IPv6 does not compress well. But you know, if anyone else has anything to say about that, please jump in. I can add that I've been yeah, thinking about this topic for a long time, and uh, it's interesting because uh, audio, you really can hear it all together and you can perceive that that is happening uh, together. But in the visuals, you do see the separation. And you know, some of those solutions have been explored in virtual reality and also through video art. Um, so there's, uh, but I think this is definitely an area uh, that we need to develop further. Yeah, it's 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 around compression. Actually, that's the problem for the viewer in Chicago. 
is that video at this point, it has to be compressed to be sent over the network. And as you could see from what we showed you with Electron, that was a live video feed of both live manipulation of the background, live biometrics, and live performance. That was all live. That wasn't pre-recorded. I mean, what we're showing you is a recording. And that was about as much as we could do. And we really worked for three months on the network infrastructure um, between New York um, and Estonia, mostly, because we had to work on the back end network to get that to work. And it was extremely difficult because we didn't do it over IPv6, the high end speed fiber optic network. We did it over normal internet or bumped up internet, but not fiber optic. We couldn't go to fiber optic for many other financial reasons. So uh, that's the real issue is that networks, maybe with 5G, that will change. But at this point, networks can't handle it. And Christina, if you know something I don't, please share. Um, I definitely um, am completely on the same page. Uh, but I've just, um, what I wanted to say is that this has really been the one of the main topics that I have been discussing these past couple of days with partners as we've taken the uh, festival completely online and um, to a, or not completely online. Um, there is still a, a, a physical exhibition here in Linz, um, which is for our regional audiences and not for our international community who cannot travel this year. Um, but a large part of the festival has in fact moved online um, and in all of these sessions, uh, collaborators, also collaborators who have been working in the field for uh, 30, 40 years, 25 years, have just um, talked about their frust frustrations in the limitations of the tools um, that we have to communicate during a time like this. Um, so I think that a lot of work uh, or a lot of research is going to go into like telepresence uh, strategies, haptic interfaces, um, maybe as a follow-up to the pandemic, as we have all been realizing how limited we feel by those tiny squares on a screen when it's become our main mode of communication. Precisely, yeah. And, and Michael, I, I don't know how you work with that um, or if you want to work with that or if that's an area of interest for you to work with. It is in a way, I mean, I think we, we have like in our theater several directors and artists working and some have a, a special focus on, on virtual reality and on, on um, individual um, treatment of the audience. So yes, um, but it, it is, it is um, but what we're doing now, because also there were other people uh, sending me um, emails in May when we were reprogramming, saying we cannot come anyway because we are there. You know, we are we are high risk. So lots of people cannot participate in a regular uh, or come to a regular play. So I think it's a very good way to to, to look for for ways. Uh, like what I was saying, how to share space and time. So we were thinking even to to play in in a whole theater, to have one show happening, and to have uh, to 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 stream the to make the audience come to the theater, but to put them in different venues and to have like an introduction in one. So to have this virtual space also in real, um, in 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 reality happening. So I think I, I definitely agree with everybody that there's a lot of um, um, space. Um, um, to, to, to gain there, but I also have a little, I'm a little bit afraid of it because technology, digital uh, tools have also a lot of disadvantage, disadvantages. And I think that culture uh, also has to be critical to that, but also give solutions. Um, you know, the, my children who were born, uh, let's say in 2000, they, they never have known a world without internet. Um, it has a lot of possibilities and it's great, but I think we should be aware of the dangers of uh, going from sex to sexting, there's a scandal going on in Belgium today, to, to like um, um, information, um, fake fake news, etc., etc. So I think uh, I think more than more than ever, we also have to take care of the of that that other part of of, um, of the theater aspect, the catharsis in the really um, um, 
very traditional way um, of, of being together and telling stories. It can happen one on one. It can happen, uh, yeah. But but I think it's worth uh, investigating for sure. I also think there are some lo-fi solutions to this that aren't like insane technological developments, but um, you know, similarly to when we were experimenting with telepresence in a physical space, it's one thing to to project something on a on a screen that reads as a screen, but it's something else to project it onto some translucent or some some scrim that makes it feel like more look more like a hologram, for example. Um, and we're experimenting uh, in, in just creating more three-dimensional web-based environments. Um, and I mean, the limitations of a camera are rectangular, but there are ways to sort of disintegrate the borders, like depending on your background um, and depending on the, the if, if you have the opportunity to experiment in three-dimensional space. It's definitely something that we're looking to, to explore, to, um, to create more of an experience where you could look around yourself and and have that that not be a uh, limited to some super high tech uh, experience. Yeah, and you know that brings up we we touched upon some points, but Michael sort of brought it in in a weird way, and um, in the past, creative uh, endeavors were not only individual but they were social movements. You know where user participants could witness and experience the making of meaning and knowledge as it succeeded, failed, or expanded. Now the pandemic has spread advanced communication networks in a way to rush her in a narcissistic era where consumers exist in isolation. The domestic space is a living satellite a thoroughly privatized space where users merely send and receive signals, a pure screen, a switching center for all the networks of influence. So, you know, that gets back to how does your platform um, address this? And I just want to say in the platform that we developed with Electron and with Battery Dance, we developed a platform that cannot be influenced by any outside company whatsoever. It is bulletproof against that. And so therefore, important. yeah, and there, and therefore we can put whatever we want into it. It is free of censorship. It is free of advertising. It is free of government control. It's free of everything. And I think, Maddie, that's your system as well. And I and I know, Sarah, over IPv6, nobody can get their hands on that stuff for the most part is, uh, that I know. And, you know, I, I don't know, Christina and Michael, about the, you know, where you situate yourself in that. Because, again, the EU and the United States are very different in that regard, or they can be you know, depending because of the, you know, I work now in the EU and I know the structural systems are very, very different. It took me quite a few years to wrap my head around just how different they were. So I'm just throwing that out, you know, because we are now all right now in our private spaces and we're going to, at least here in New York, going to be there for quite some time still. We're even having tremendous problems with school reopening. Um, so how uh, work, how let's just, we've been skirting around this, but let's talk about like plans for action. Are there specific plans for action that you know of? Well, I think that, that this pandemic um, takes to the surface or shows very well um, what's, being, what's going wrong in our societies, as well in the art society as in our societies in general. Um, you see the weaknesses of all the societies and of all the, the political systems really, really uh, very sharp. So education is like really a major issue. And, and what you were saying in the beginning of some people controlling all, all the news, whether there be scientists or politicians, whether there's a paranoia going on. So these polarizations on COVID believers or not believers and, and the, the power they have is, is so important. So education, information, but also art is part of that, is, 
is, is becoming so, so important. So what you were saying is also right. In a crisis, there's always these DIY movements and it can shut down anything because it will always be um, to pop up again. But it's important to be very, I think, solidaire. Uh, how do you say that in English? Uh, um, to have solidarity. Have solidarity, yeah. yeah. Yeah, to have it there. So therefore, this kind of meetings like, like are so important to see how, how other countries do do that kind of stuff. Because if, if every... And what, what you were saying about the quote you were reading now, I totally agree with it. I think theater has the power to deconnect us from all this digital world uh, for, for like an hour or an hour and a half. So um, deconnection is very important, deconnection and being together. So I think we should fight um, um, like we were doing in Belgium, I think it's all over Europe now, to reopen schools, to reopen education, because it's too important and to reopen theaters, to reopen also theaters for schools and to, to, to make, to put all our energy in creating safe, safe spaces but in a new uh, sense or a new sense in a new meaning safe spaces as being covid proof uh, spaces where where we can uh, deal with the audiences in a safe way i think that's very important okay anyone else uh, i would second um what michael has said and this is obviously from a perspective of um an institution who is very focused on their audience and who um who relies basically on the fact that we need to provide a framework for our audiences where they are safe, where they can interact with art, uh, artworks in a safe way, where they can interact with artists in a safe way, um, but also to create exhibition spaces that are uh, safe, um, experiences of exhibition that people can uh, actually take part in at the moment which is actually a, a little bit harder if you work in a in a institution or in a museum that is very much based on providing haptic experiences and on bringing together people and even in workshop environments uh, relies on kind of if kids and teenagers or or young people are working together uh, it's usually a very non-COVID proof situation. So I think for us, the, the huge next part will be to find ways of how can we still be a platform for our audience, um, both for the festival audience, which will be more tricky, I think, um, as we are going to see the next year unfold, uh, but also for our regional audiences where we have a very strong network, as I was saying, um, of schools and educators and teachers, um, but also artistic community here in the, in the region who are using some of our infrastructures. So I think that's going to be the challenge or that is the challenge that we are working on at the moment. How can we provide space, uh, safe spaces, uh, be it in, in the festival context at the moment or in the museum? Um, so that's what we are going to work on at the moment. Um, and that's what's going to be our task, I think, for the next year to kind of uh, refocus ourselves in this new um, situation that we find ourselves in. And I think, again, here we have to say that we are in a very different situation than you guys are in the US. So we have, in fact, been able to reopen the museum in a limited capacity for tours and and uh, we've been able to create some spaces where uh, we have brought artists back into our into our spaces where we have brought the audience back um so i think that's also important to contextualize that um our, our we are in different kind of of situations at the moment um but i see that as one of the challenges that that's going to be um part of, of our our work next year and, and as we end this year. Yeah, I, I, I you know, um, there's a lot of initiatives, Evo, the producer here was bringing up about uh, AR and VR and HoloLens and so on and so forth. And the thing I want to say in terms of a sort of New York attitude is just look what Facebook did with Oculus. You know, and how you now have to register to use it and it tracks you. And that should really send uh, some very chilling and very wake up and smell the coffee because um, that 
is the bubble for techno utopianism right there. And the platforms that Maddie and Culture Hub and Sarah and now Nets Arts and what we developed at ThoughtWorks Arts Art Hack with Electron are completely removed from those systems of control, completely. And I think when you talk about responses to COVID-19, um, quick artist DIY responses, these are three really great examples of uh, people with the know-how and uh, communities. Let's not forget the communities of creatives mm -hmm. that jump in on this. To be able to take matters into their own hands and come up with solutions that circumvent and disrupt established and traditional um, media outlet and control of information routes. So I just wanted to, um, you know, highlight that because uh, it's very, very important in moving forward, as, as you pointed out, as climate change gets worse and we're confined at different times more in our own spaces, to keep developing these new platforms. And, you know, we welcome Europe and anyone else who wants to integrate and work with um, all of us to develop those platforms because we have them and we have the proof of them now. They exist, they're functional, um, they're not going away. And, you know, we're, we're ready, we're ready. We've, we've, we've passed the test with what you need to deal with this. So I just want to thank ours and the grid and um, everyone for participating because these are time sensitive and critical issues at this moment that are gonna carry forward now for the next two decades, I think. Yeah, I, if it's okay, I just wanna to speak to that really briefly. Um, Long-term Culture Hub is really um, trying to establish a decentralized network that um, when, you know, when when New York has to shut down for whatever reason that the network can still sustain, that it's not a, okay, we're dark and nothing's going to happen, that that there's a system, like that. that's how the system is built. Um, I also think that uh, in the shorter term, the thing that we're most focused on is liveness and um, in that sense, it's also really great to work within time zones. So we're, we're looking for more um, collaboration across time zones um, and, and we're exploring all of this in our storytelling. It's not just that we're exploring this in the software that we're developing, but um, in the stories that we're telling which isn't to say it's all sci-fi or whatever, but the question of how how do we connect and how do we be together and and what are it's so fraught um, and that's really what we're what we're exploring artistically. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I, I agree. And you know, um, Culture Hub has such a what is it a fifty year history, which in in New York is um, prehistoric. Yeah, La Mama founded in 1961 with the Off Off Broadway movement, and so we're constantly looking to that time period. Which, you know, it, it, there there are there are similarities and and total differences, but um, it's a it's inspiring to look to the roots of where La Mama came from and where this the avant garde in the U.S. at least started, um, and we're we're really connected with that. Okay, so looking to the future, that's what we'll have to do for next year, and our time is up. So I want to thank all of you great panelists. It's been really interesting. Um, it's a real honor to be part of this and meet you all and discuss this with you. And uh, hopefully we can all meet potentially at ours next year. Yes, keep our fingers crossed. <laughs> thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. Right, bye-bye. Thanks.